us bringing us to the sea floor. There were some, you know, we didn't really know uh, fully exactly how Atalanta would perform, I think. Um, our, probably our ROV pilots and ROV team could speak more to that, but, but to me at least these uh, images have been remarkable and it's not the same as, as having little Hercules or, or Hercules uh, in shallower depths, but um, just so it's, uh, it's quite, quite impressive and we're thankful that these technologies can bring us into this realm. And Dan, that speaks really to the uncertainty of the ocean. I mean, when we enter these spaces, we have all of these expectations. We can make all of these um, expedition objectives and have all of these goals that we would like to reach while we're here. But at the end of the day, it is really up to Kanaloa, as we are in a very sacred realm of Po, of um, ancestral Moana uh, Nui the primordial darkness. And so being in this place, I mean, really, and in any ocean, in any body of water, it's nature that will make the final decision as to what really happens. Absolutely. Kanaloa makes the call. We know that well from voyaging. Yes, most definitely. And, you know, we are just here, and whatever we can learn from these depths, these, this kaiuli, uh, the depths of the sea, it really is a privilege. Um, and it's just our kuleana, it's our job, it's our responsibility, it's our duty to do our due diligence and then to learn from all of these lessons that are being revealed by our oceans. To illustrate just how sacred this place is, um, we have a viewer sharing a story with us, a mo'olelo. Honestly, <laughs> it's gonna be hard to read, but we're so appreciative of folks sharing this. We know this is not unique, but writes, hello, my father, Ralph S. Goodwin. It's a radio operator on the Yorktown at the Battle of Midway. He was among the sailors who abandoned ship on orders of their commanding officer. He never talked about it much, but I do know he was in the water for nearly an hour holding fast to a tow rope behind a lifeboat. I suppose all of his personal belongings are still in a locker somewhere on board. Ralph S. Goodwin died in January 2019 at age 96. Mahalo to all the viewers who are here wow. with deep personal connections to this place, to this story. Mahalo Nui for sharing that, thank you. We appreciate your mo'olelo, your stories, and how you're connected to this place, how you're connected to this vessel, how you're connected to our oceans. Yorktown has been visited one other time, um, found by a team that was being led by Dr. Robert Ballard, the founder of Ocean Exploration Trust, um, in 1998. Uh, and a survey was conducted, but I believe that um, this survey being able to be shared with the world, uh, with experts on shore, um, with all of you watching at home, at work, in your classrooms, um, and this extensively, image this extensively, this is something totally new. This is truly a historic moment to understand how this shipwreck has changed over the last 25 years and, and just to get a, a deeper look and a uh, even stronger connection to this moment in history. Is this midship elevator the one with the mural? Oh yeah, I think it is. I couldn't really make it out, but yeah, uh, there is a historic mural in there. 
And there's not really an understanding of what it depicts, I guess. There's no real photo of it. Right. Just some sailors making art on their journeys across the Pacific? Is that, is that uh, what? Yeah, not, not really sure. Um, apparently, they got a part of it in the imaging from 1998, uh, but I'm not sure what it, what it is. Catalina, we have a ship move in? Or yes, um, yeah, we we had moved uh, 10 meters, so we're we're just about to the end of that, that short jump. Okay. Um, we could go ahead and call yeah, the next one. Yeah, let's do that. We can, uh, whatever, I think yeah, that... Yeah, we haven't moved very far. I think the stern yeah. is like at, at 2.15, or yes. a heading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we'll I'll go that. ahead and maybe do another 20 meters. Bridge now. Could we please move to zero meters at bearing 215? Thank you. Does that white stuff look like corrosion to you, Mike? Yeah. For those just tuning in, uh, Hans or Mike, do you want to describe what we're looking down into now and kind of where we are um, positioned on the ship? Sure, we're looking down into the midship's elevator on the flight deck. These were elevators used to bring aircraft up from the hangar deck where they were they were serviced down below and armed and fueled and brought up to the flight deck uh, and parked in ready status. There were three elevators on the flight deck and this is the midships one just aft of the island or tower which is the superstructure that is iconic for these aircraft carriers, which is located on the starboard side. So we are kind of uh, incrementally making our way aft over the opening of the midship elevator. And we've been looking at this banding, this, this patch that's near them, and we understand these are expansion joints in the flight deck. The flight deck is Douglas fir, actually, over steel. I'm always surprised to hear that. I always think, you know, if you're going to build with wood for use wood for ships, get something like teak or. Uh, but uh, the contract called for Douglas fir. We saw a coral forest on our first dive of this Ala Almuana Kaiuli expedition, and um, here we have a Douglas fir. <laughs> forest laid out as a as an incredible deck on this historical vessel yeah it's pretty remarkable that that was made from timber mm -hmm. is that an arresting line going across there interesting Yeah, I'm looking at a plan of the ship and just aft of the midship elevators are, looks like a series of three arresting line assemblies. Huh. So these would be used to trap the aircraft landing on deck. Oh yeah. There were no catapults to launch these aircraft. They had to run into the wind and at full speed to get them off the deck, but to land, they dropped the tail hook yeah. and hopefully catch one, two, or three of these wires. If you are good, you catch the first one. Not so good, you get the second one. 
If you catch too many of the third wires, I guess you have to go back for more training or something. Uh -huh. I don't know how I got so lucky, but I had the opportunity to go on board the John C. Stennis when she was coming back from the, the Red Sea and mm. making a port of call stop in Honolulu. And somehow I got on a list, so they flew us out to the carrier. We made a, a wire landing. I've never experienced deceleration like that in my life, and oh, I'm bad. lucky I won't ever experience it again. I imagine that was a very unique experience. But um, I, I had a really interesting time meeting the crew, the young crew, some 5,000 sailors wow. who had been on board for months, and we got to talk with them about their jobs and how they felt, toured the ship, and it was it was really an interesting experience. Wow, the crew of 5,000, that's almost unimaginable, you know, and ships like Nautilus, the crew is around 50. So it's, it's, it's just orders of magnitude different. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Two orders of magnitude, yes. So um, I have a really hard time imagining just that big an operation. I hope I'm not misremembering that number. I'm going to have to look it up now. The carriers are very large. <laughs> I was in the Coast Guard, and uh, our berthing area was 60 man. We were in six packs. The bunks were three high and then right next to each other. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. little, it's a little more comfortable on the Nautilus, huh? Yeah. A little bit. Oh, Robert. Nautilus, this is Silver Springs. Can you hear? We can hear you, Silver Springs. Given the ship change, we uh, just wanted to reintroduce some folks here in Silver Spring, Maryland at our Expedition Command Center. Please uh, do. Joining this, uh, joining this expedition since the beginning. So we have three teams here in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. So I'm Jeremy Wyrick. I'm the director of NOAA Ocean Exploration, working very closely here with Ocean Exploration Trust, Trust and our Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute team that's able to put this on. But we're joined with our expedition partners here, uh, Naval History and Heritage Command, as well as Search Incorporated. So we have six individuals here in the room, and I'd like for them to introduce themselves as well, going down the line. And I'm going to start with Phil Hartmeyer, our maritime archaeologist here at NOAA. Thanks, Jeremy. Phil Hartmeyer, marine archaeologist at NOAA Ocean Exploration. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to, to join this fine collaborative team on exploring the depths of Yorktown and other sites as, as part of this expedition. Um, sitting next to me is a, another great asset to the team, and pass to Jim. Hi, this is Jim Delgado. I'm the Senior Vice President of Search Inc. We're a cultural resources company and the largest archaeological company in the United States. Joining me um, as co-lead on this uh, the science is Phil, but also joining me from search is John. Hi folks, my name is John Elderson. Uh, I'm the Maritime Archaeology Secretary of Search working with Jim on all of our uh, underwater and offshore projects. So thank you very much uh, sitting to my left or sitting to my right. I'm uh, Frank Thompson. I'm the Acting Assistant Director for Collection Management for Naval History and Heritage Command. Uh, we have oversight of the Navy's underwater archaeology program and some military craft. It's a uh, honor to be part of this expedition. Uh, we're looking forward to expanding our knowledge of uh, Yorktown as well as um, the Japanese carriers that uh, we were also part of discovery of in 2019 under a different expedition. So, and my colleague is Alexis Alexander. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Alexis Katsambis. I head uh, the Naval History and Heritage uh, Command Underwater Archaeology Program. Uh, the Navy is responsible for almost 3,000 shipwrecks around the world. This is one of the most prominent and most important in the Navy's history, so we are very fortunate and feel very privileged to have uh, been invited to partake in this mission. Um, thank uh, NOAA Ocean Exploration and the Ocean Exploration Trust for making it possible. Thanks, Alexis. As, as you all can hear, it takes many partners to make an expedition like this happen. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary 
expedition where we had a chance to see some biological, geological features, and here we're having a chance to dive, a rare opportunity to dive on the solemn site here at the USS Yorktown. Um, but like I said, with, the, with all the partners able to come in, we're able to make that happen because of the great technology that we use here on Nautilus, as well as no ocean exploration vessel, the NOAA ship Oceanus Explorer, we were able to beam these images around the world and be able to access everybody here on the expedition team, but also everybody at home, be able to view us live. It's pretty critical for us because we can only have so many people on board the ship, but if we're able to take this technology and these images and beam it around, we're able to get more and more eyes on target and different experts and different voices in on the conversation and get more eyes out here to explore and discover. Uh, so it's not just people on board the ship. So we appreciate everybody who's tuning in today to be able to join us on this momentous occasion. And thank you all there over at Nautilus. Appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you all. It's such an honor to have such uh, distinguished scholars, experienced folks on shore, um, helping and also experienced very amazing team here in the van. We, we uh, The collaboration is part of this beautiful story that is uh, that is filled with hope. Uh, around how far we've come in our ability to communicate and, and collaborate and, and work together um, to accomplish some amazing things. So we appreciate you all being here with us, helping us tell this story. A hole from the bomb here. It looks We're like looking a, towards the steer, steering. Looks like a yeah. hole in the deck. So Hans, are we looking at potentially more damage here? Yeah, it looks like that may be a. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, if this is. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. If we're if we just moved aft of that elevator, this is an area where a heavy bomb exploded on the flight deck, opening up a 12 by 12 hole uh, with fragment dan damage on the hangar deck during the battle. They patched this uh, to get her back into shape, to continue to fight. But when the vessel sank, I mean, probably that had that patch did not hold. But this is another piece, direct bit of evidence, you know, of the of the battle damage that Yorktown took. Catalina, we do want to just keep continuing this direction, so whenever you need to make the next move. <laughs> yeah, so, that. yeah, we're actually about halfway across this last one. It okay. was a 20-meter move, and we've moved about 10 meters. So. Okay, just check, yep, yeah. just checking. We have an amazing team in the front row um, helping navigate the ship and ROV and piloting the ROV at when you guys have a moment, if you want to reintroduce yourselves, we've, we've, I don't think you have since we've come back on watch. It'd be great to hear from you guys too. Good morning. Um, my name is Catalina Rubiano. I'm serving here as the navigator, working alongside Bob and Zach as we navigate the ROVs through these incredible submarine landscapes. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I'm Robert Waters. I'm a pilot. And uh, ashore, I'm OET's um, facilities manager and ROV engineer, and our facilities in San Pedro, California, it's the south part of LA. You forgot absolute legend, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot that too. I just started. <laughs> <laughs> another another 28 years. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, I'm Zach uh, Gonzalez, uh, Robert's co-pilot right out of Atlanta. 
Um, been doing ROV on and off for a few years, but it's a great honor to come out here and experience this uh, firsthand. And I'm uh, Amber, and I'm a video engineer, um, and just just really just astounded uh, by being like the privilege of being here and, and the imaging that we're seeing, and it's just incredible. The images we're seeing in part, thanks to your awesome work thank as our video you. engineer, Amber. <laughs> thank you. And uh, we should we should probably go down the line also and uh, Kukui. Actually, could I could I interrupt super super quick of just course. to yeah. um, so I can go ahead and preemptively call this next yep. move. We don't expect any kind of like anything ahead of us that we might want to be careful with. I don't think with. so. Okay, all right. I'll just go ahead and call that. Yeah, this now. shouldn't be. Y'all can continue now. Um, hello, uh, um, hello, my kako, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Kukui, and I am one of the data loggers on board. And truly humbled and grateful to be here with you all, sharing this uh, experience in this really sacred and special place. Mahalo. Virginia? Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm hey, Amber, can we zoom in yeah. Yeah. a little bit I'm just to get this so hole? so honored and privileged to be a part of this and to be seeing this. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you. I'm Hans van Tilburg, um, archaeologist for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And I'm uh, found being on board the Nautilus and conducting multidisciplinary missions like this to be one of the best learning experiences anyone could experience. I. Uh, I'm, <coughs> oops. I'm Mike Brennan, uh, maritime archaeologist with Search. I am the co-lead scientist on this uh, expedition uh, and very excited to be here at Midway and uh, see what, what the next couple of days of dives bring us. All right, I'm Val Finlayson. I'm a postdoc at the University of Maryland and uh, the other co-lead scientist. I gotta say, this is, this is incredibly humbling to be here. It's, it's just been an incredible experience having everybody on shore and uh, here on the ship working together like this. Mahalo Val and everyone else on board. It's an amazing, uh, amazing watch team. It's incredible, this mix of excitement and also this, this, uh, this humbling feeling, this somber feeling that comes over as we see this place. We have so many folks who are tuning in hey, to- Hey, make up? tuning in, wondering if we're going to see the other shipwrecks that are in the area, and they, they want to know about future plans, and, and I just encourage everyone to uh, be as fully present, um, speaking, knowing how hard that can be, and, uh, just be fully present in this place. Um, yeah, we've been gifted with some incredible uh, weather conditions that yeah. let this dive happen. Yeah, for sure. That's right. And Daniel? Shore side here, just so everybody once again sees this, we're at the edge of the midship's flight deck, and the patch, the patch is now gone, exposing one of the fatal wounds to USS Yorktown during the battle. And this is where a heavy explosive bomb came through the flight deck and detonated, and you can see some of the torn metal between the, the planks punched right on through, and that is that hole. That is... Wow. That's it. So is this strapping, was that part of the repair? It looks like it. Yeah, I think so. I don't think well, This happened early on and this was repaired, but that repair did not hold over time. Yeah, I see this metal strap going across there. Yeah. Yeah, looking at the, the pictures of the repair, no, that's actually part of the flight deck. Oh. That's not part of the repair. That's actually, you, you can actually see that that metal strip running across the flight deck. Hmm. And like you had mentioned, Dan, that this is a privilege of a lifetime and we slowly navigate these waters with great caution, great reverence, and with intention. Um, we have our pilots and our navigation
skillfully maneuvering our ROV Atalanta. I just wanted to make sure, Daniel, that you folks did your introductions as well. Yeah, Mahina, you want to you want to share a little bit more. Yeah, aloha kakahiaka kako, Mahina Lenny Cavallari ko inoa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mahina Lenny Cavallari. I'm from the island of Oahu, and it is my great privilege to be on board the Nautilus, uh, sailing for the first time into Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument as a Kanako Iwi, as a young Native Hawaiian, coming into this space, um, entering this realm of Po, of Kanaloa, we see this as our Aina Kupuna, our older islands. Um, it's sacred spiritually um, and culturally to us as Kanako Iwi. And to come into this space with this crew, to be able to see the images, um, to reach these depths has been an honor. So just mahalo to everyone, to all of the partners on shore within the control van and the rest of the crew, all of the people, the many hands who made this happen, the collaboration, the work that went into this. So mahalo, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, it's mahalo. A mahalo nui, Mahina. I just want to lift up Mahina and many of our Kanako Oivi colleagues who are on board. Um, helping us walk through this through protocol, through cultural protocol, um, through a sacred perspective that, um, that's teaching us, teaching us all about what it means to ask for permission, what it means to, to walk and to dive in humility. Um, it's, it's been uh, a remarkable part of this experience is not just what we're seeing on the seafloor, but what we see in each other as we go on these expeditions, as we explore together, as we become dear friends, um, kind of bonded by by this incredible exploration that we're lucky to be a part of and by our connection to the ocean and to Kanaloa. And, um, there's, uh, we can't say thank you enough to, to Mahina and, and Malia who was just on watch before us and those who are helping to uh, facilitate that by, by reminding us of the right way to enter into these spaces. So uh, I'm Daniel Kinzer. I'm the Science Communication Fellow on board uh, and on the 12 no, on the 8 to 12 watch. Uh, forgot my watch there for a second. Um, starts to get blurry, but it's a, as everyone said, it's an absolute honor to be a part of this team. Um, it's an incredible opportunity to engage in this historic exploration. Um, it's been a remarkable Ala Amoana Kaiuli expedition already. We have, this is our third dive, and the chance to see um, all of the life, the full circle of life, um, that uh, is here on the seafloor in Papahana Mokuakea, the sacred, sacred waters and Kopuna Islands, um, the elder islands uh, of the Hawaiian people and, uh, and Hawaiian islands. It's just really a, really a joy. Um, I also am from Oahu and live, live in Honolulu, where I work uh, with a great organization called Purple Maia Foundation, uh, bringing... Uh, culturally grounded technology education to exploration like this. So love connecting from on board with young students and families back home on the islands in Hawaii, helping share this with them. So glad we have this telepresence capability. And uh, also have the pleasure of, of sometimes getting to sail with Mahina on Hokulea and Hikianalia, <laughs> our, uh, our Wa'akaulua. And I'm gonna pass this over to those who I'm just going to be quiet as we look at this battle <laughs> damage, actually. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, it has been uh, the utmost you know, privilege, privilege and pleasure um, being able to sail with you on traditional Va'akaulua, our traditional Hawaiian sailing canoes, um, and then also coming on board on Nautilus. And so just to have you as a crew member, as an alaka'i, a leader, a mentor, on board both um, our traditional Va'ar, traditional canoes, and then even on Nautilus, um, I am very grateful for you, so. Oh, mahalo, mahalo, mihina, mahalo. And speaking of, uh, not to deflect, because that means a lot to me, and I want to <laughs> hold on to that, but I also want to acknowledge our amazing 
expedition leaders who have been up through the night yes. and uh, have been guiding us throughout this mm -hmm. Allah Amwana Kauli expedition and without whom we would uh, not be where we are. So yes. uh, maybe we can get some introductions. So kind. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it's such a privilege to be part of this team and, you know, the gift to be able to help um, guide and support this team in doing the work that we're truly world class at doing. Uh, I'm Megan Cook. I'm the co expedition leader and communications lead for the Ala Al Moana Kaiuli expedition. Uh, I'm also the director of education and outreach for Ocean Exploration Trust, where I get to work with a really talented team to help elevate and share stories from the deep sea. Um, these, these stories, maritime heritage, any story in Papahanaumokuakea is really, um, in my heart, like tip top of those lists, opportunities to really tell human stories, um, deep stories about uh, what we share with the ocean. I am from the great oceanography state of Idaho, and uh, but call Friday Harbor, Washington, and the San Juan Islands home now. And my fearless co-leader here, here through the night with me, who I'm also so grateful to be working beside, Daniel. Yeah, mahalo, uh, Dan and Megan, for those very, very kind words. Uh, I'm Daniel Wagner, uh, co-leading this expedition with Megan, uh, chief scientist for the Ocean Exploration Trust. So I have the honor, responsibility to plan the the science aspects of our missions, not just this, but this is actually one of 12 expeditions that we have that will bring E.B. Nautilus around some of the most remote and spectacular places of the Pacific here through the next couple of months. Uh, and this mission in particular has been a, an absolute extraordinary journey, uh, something that started about two years ago with the first proposals to, to bring Nautilus to this place uh, and then assemble the team uh, to come and execute this mission and it's just been an honor to uh, work with this enormously talented group, both on the ship and on shore, bring everybody's uh, peace into this equation. Uh, there's been thousands of people whose stories have a long, long history and a, an attachment and a really intimate connection to this place and bring those stories in, a, in an honorable way into this mission. And just blending also the, the state of the art technologies that we have on board here with some of the approaches that have endured the test of time uh, just a, an absolute uh, honor to look over the shoulder here as I'm looking into the control van, reading in the WhatsApp group the names of the people on shore who have uh, woken up and through the night spent uh, over uh, uh, 12 hours with us. Uh, yeah, just an absolute, absolute privilege. And I'll give one more shout out to our, our, our technical uh, team here, the, the navigators, pilots, uh, mappers, it is not easy to do this. Uh, we had a, a, a small target that we thought was there. The team mapped it, located it, and then basically landed the ROV straight on the 50 yard line. It was just <laughs> unbelievable. And the pilots and navigators just navigating around this enormous wreck and doing it so gracefully. The ROV, this is, this is the third string team that, uh, in terms of our ROVs that we're using for this uh, particular dive because uh, uh, we've had a couple logistical challenges and it is it's truly stunning to see the quality of the imagery with, with this third string ROV and it's, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a privilege, honor to be part of this and, and, and see this and yeah, just mahalo to everyone that has contributed their time, passion, effort, dedication over the last years, uh, mahalo. Mahalo, Daniel. We won't uh, we won't tell Atalanta on you that you called you called it third string when it gets back on the deck. But <laughs> but I, I do I I am thankful that you highlighted the challenge of this for those who were watching when we first acquired the Yorktown. They may have thought, oh, this must be so easy because we did just land just right on top. Right. It was unbelievable, actually. I didn't it wasn't even expecting to see it quite yet, and and just. Uh, to just come almost into the bridge um, from <laughs> at five over 5,000 meters deep mm -hmm. uh, was so remarkable. But maybe we could share a little bit more about what what makes some of these kinds of deep expeditions, deep dives, challenging, um, so that the audience understands even a little more uh, 
some of the some of the challenges associated with this kind of effort. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. So that's yeah, there, there's challenges in many different facets and complexities on, on that. Uh, you know, the, just the remoteness, I think, is something that people don't uh, really recognize. So we are here uh, over a thousand miles from the closest uh, human habitated place. Uh, so that you know, we are in a place in the world where the, the closest human beings are really the, the 48 people that are with me here on the ship. Uh, the next closest are the ones that are in the International Space Station. So we are really out there. We are in the middle of the Pacific. It takes you know, five days of steam to get here, uh, and it takes a lot of teamwork, and it takes a lot of you know, just cleverness and being resourceful. Uh, so just getting out here. Um, and then the other, of course, the other facet of the remoteness of getting to these steps. So we are basically at the at, at the at the bottom of the seafloor of the Pacific. Most of the Pacific bottoms out at about 5,500 meters. So so we are in the, the most remote place of the Pacific in, in, in all of its um, ways. And yeah, it takes a, uh, some extraordinary human beings. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the, the third string that we had to go through plan ABC, both in terms of the technology available, looking at weather windows, when we could start this dive, when we could start approaching, um, making sure uh, that we choose the best possible window. Uh, and you have to always look ahead, look, you know, the next 48 hours, next week ahead, the best predictions when the weather and window might open. It's a, it was about a five hour descent to get here. Um, so you're always kind of planning. Uh, you have to make sure the conditions are gonna be favorable uh, in that time frame. And it's, uh, yeah, so those are a lot of the challenges. And then uh, the really wonderful part of this journey has been just to see the, the partnership and the collaborations coming through here. Uh, several people have mentioned this, but the story of exploration of the Battle of Midway really started in the in the late 90s when Dr. Bob Ballard you know, first ventured to this, this place, uh, an expedition uh, that included the Navy, National Geographic Society, and several other partners that, that led to the discovery of, of the Yorktown. And since then, there have been several uh, expeditions, probably about a dozen or so, to, to come back to this place. I actually was in this very place eight years ago. Uh, we had two expeditions in 2015 and 16 to another one of our sister ships, the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, when we had two expeditions that we tried to get to the bottom of these places, but weather did not collaborate. We were sitting on station for almost three weeks. And I think one of the gentlemen that's sitting at the Exploration Command Center there in Silver Spring, Mashkur Malik, now with NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration, he was with me there. We had you know, 30 foot faces, uh, seas, uh, basically throughout the expedition and that weather and window never opened and we never were able to see the seafloor. Uh, but throughout this time, there's been you know, dozens of people that have been very passionate about coming back here. And over the last couple of years of planning this mission, we've been trying to patch together, stitch together this level of these partners, many of which have been working on this for, for many years. Uh, so yeah, Naval History and Heritage Command no Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, no Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, Nauticus, uh, the DPAA, many who have intimate knowledge of this, this place. And so just getting to bring these people together, everybody has a little piece of the puzzle. And then when you put them together and, and really try to uh, bring together the, the great wealth of knowledge that we all have in, in different forms and different knowledge bases, uh, it's, it's really remarkable and uh, you know, wonderful for they have a, a small part in. Oh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, so many factors, um, such a complex scenario playing out over decades, over years and decades of of uh, efforts to to bring the Yorktown, the USS Yorktown, uh, to life um, for the world, um, to remember this story, and uh, it took everyone doing their jobs well. It took Kanaloa being on our side, the ocean and, and the weather being on our side, and it also took exceptional leadership. So thank you both to you and Megan again um, for that. This is uh, such a pleasure to be a part of this team, a small part 
a recent addition, but uh, just just thrilled to uh, to be to be here with you all. Just a, a quick nav update. Um, we are moving up at the top side, and once Atalanta starts catching up, we should be arriving, if I'm oriented correctly, towards that that aft elevator. Once once we get there. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, this part of the flight deck is pretty, uh... Boring? <laughs> That's a good word for it. I was going to say something nicer, but yeah, sure. Robert, this is a forest. This is a Douglas fir forest. <laughs> likely likely taken from uh, Oregon or Washington, probably somewhere up there in the Pacific Northwest. It's where these Douglas firs like to grow really big, or at least used to. Um, and... Uh, yeah, fascinating, Robert. Fascinating <laughs> flight, flight deck. A little flat, maybe. Featureless, flat. I think, was what I was going for. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's what you want with a flight deck, ideally. It is, yeah. yeah. Right. It's, it is. it's still doing its job. So our, our shoreside support, are we correct? Of looking at these plans, there were a series of three arresting wires just aft of the midship's elevator? Is that yeah, it would appear so. But the other thing, as we're talking about this empty flight deck, I think, you know, what we also need to remember, you know, particularly as we look at historical photographs, is this flight deck covered uh, during action, but also in transiting to action with, and literally covered with aircraft. And the reminder of that in its own way are these strips of metal we see, some of them mm -hmm. earlier torn from the bottom head, that were used to tie down and secure those aircraft on the deck while transiting. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, for that reminder and for bringing this um, this deck to life um, in action in life not at all featureless uh, covered in aircraft colored covered in servicemen going about their duties bravely uh, in combat in transit um, this uh, it's a excellent reminder to um, to use our imaginations and our historical knowledge to um, to put us back onto this this living deck that would have been uh, would have been quite the so just to be rich place. To be clear, we're also we see metal strips. Those are the expansion joints. There are also round tie downs with a little bar running through them, and that's what's sure. used to secure those aircraft. Okay, that's interesting. So oh, thank we're, you for that. we're seeing two things there, and they're smaller features. But again, these are expansion joints that you see here, but also in here, in between there, you will be able to pick out, I'm not seeing one right now this minute, but you will also be able to pick out these tie downs. So a now empty, seemingly silent deck upon, upon which many things happened and many aircraft were deployed, transported, what we're seeing here? took off and landed. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. What do you, what do you guys think? I believe I remember from earlier in the watch uh, learning that up to 90 aircraft may have been on the uh, capacity of, of 90 aircraft on the on uh, the USS Yorktown. Well, oh, you're remembering something something from your last watch. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a whole like 19 hours ago. Yeah, your 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 watch has never ended, so it's uh, hard, <laughs> hard. But I, uh, yeah, amazing. Coming out. Oh yes. Robert. Robert. Yeah. Did you want me to come back out? Yeah. Okay. Back out. I think your mic's a little low, so it's hard for me to hear you. Okay, thank you. You know, when we do see those features of the USS Yorktown, um, like the warp staircase or the door that was left ajar then we can really imagine the foots that stepped there, the individuals who were on board. And I think in those moments, it really transcends us to that era, that time, that place. Um, and it does connect us. I mean, it connects us with their stories and using our imagination to imagine that um, there are people here, uh, there was conflict here, there was tragedy here.
Yeah, important to remember. That's right. It's important to remember what this uh, incredible vessel resting here at the bottom of the ocean uh, was like 5,000 meters above on the surface. Um, 824 feet long, uh, 109 feet, just over 109 feet across, 90 aircraft. I think I heard something on the order of, it was in the 2000s of pers in terms of personnel that, that were sometimes yeah. operating on this vessel, if, if you include folks who were in the air service. Yep. And uh, it would have been just a remarkable floating city um, dedicated to to its mission. I think seeing the uh, the the ladders and the, the small staircases and the and the doors um, also give a sense of scale because um, I mean th this ship was eight uh, four times the size of Nautilus, approximately. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's huge. But you, 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 we're just looking at a, a small part from a from a vehicle underwater. It, it's kind of hard to get a sense of scale. But when you when you see the ladder, I mean, it almost looks like dollhouse furniture. Like it's compared to the size of the wreck, it's so small. So it's like it really gives you a, that sense of like it's it's an object that we know the size of. So it, that really puts it in perspective as to how big this this uh, ship really is. It's true. Was, is. Impressive back then and still as proof of concept, they're just as impressive today in terms mm -hmm. of size. Yeah. Uh, although I will admit, though, I was wrong about the 5,000 crewmen on the John C. Stennis. Ah, <laughs> uh, gotcha. 6,500. Oh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you underestimated. Wow. <laughs> That's with the embarked wow. air wing, 6,500. And that's a floating Talk city. Talk about a floating Sailors, city, yeah. Young men and women, so. Wow. Unbelievable. That is a lot of people. Yeah, it is. My, um, now th I that's, think that's bigger than my hometown. I, wa I wonder what they have to do for stores. Yeah, right? That's a lot of food and, and supplies to bring on board. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, hopefully they have a better system than having a haul it all down the passageway. Yeah, they might not. <laughs> they have a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> we have some curiosity from those tuning in online. Thank you to everyone who's tuning in on Nautilus Live and on YouTube, joining this expedition and this exploration with us. One of the questions is, uh, what what comes after this dive? Uh, now that we've now that we've gathered some of this data, we have some of this video imagery, and uh, we've been able to. Um, you know, characterize some of the battle damage and other things. So where does the science and archaeology go from here? Yeah, so we'll um, we'll take we'll take the data back and we're, we're going to review it. Um, uh, our colleague uh, at Silver Spring, uh, Phil Hartmeyer, he and, and uh, a colleague of his are going to work on some of the video we just took at the uh, the island in the smokestack and, and try to make a 3D on that move. Yep. Th yeah, I'll call the next one soon. A 3D ortho mosaic out of it, um, so that we can really look at the detail uh, of that of that feature, and and we'll we'll review the the still imagery as well, um, and kind of uh, compare that to some of the data that we have from 1998, as well as some of the other after action reports that we've been referencing here, and uh, probably write up um, you know some kind of a report uh, based on that, um, and from there. Uh, we'll yeah we'll see where it goes. Right. I think OET could speak to what's accessible in terms of yeah. of, of images. Is Megan online still? I am here. I missed the question though. Oh yeah, the, there was a question from uh, listeners about you know what happens to the data. What where do we go from here? How is this used? How is it shared? Oh absolutely. Well, uh, if you hear typing at the speed of light back here. It's because we're, uh, we've mentioned so many times the collaborators and support of the team and um, our Ocean Exploration Trust team is working ashore right now, creating some highlight videos to be able to recap this dive, um, see the key moments and, and really share and expand the story as we go out. So uh, just now on Ocean Exploration Trust's Facebook Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, you will find um, some of our favorite first look images of the ship. Um, we'd love for you to check those out and share them with anyone else that would love to be part of this story. Um, we'll continue to roll out those stories as well. 
um, in the days ahead. Uh, other parts of this, you know, one of the really wonderful things about Ocean Exploration Trust's approach to how we do this work is that the data is open. You can see how many partners are here together now as part of the expedition, and we'll continue to expand that. Um, there will be a lot of analysis afterwards, and certainly with our, our key partners that manage this area, you know, our support to them as they look at these cultural resources and how we can protect them into the future. So um, I anticipate this data about not only this site, but of course um, our entire month of exploration of Ala Amoana Kaiuli contributing to the uh, sanctuary designation process that is underway right now. Papa Hanamo Kuakea is being considered for an additional layer of protection as a national marine sanctuary, um, but also to contribute to the to the ongoing science and management. You know how do we've recognized and designated and honored uh, the knowledge and uh, tradition and deep reverence of the Native Hawaiian people to protect this place. Um, so that's designated, but how do we keep that going forward in a, in a changing world? So all of this data is, is a part of a much, much bigger story. Thank you. Maybe um, our, our partners from Naval History and Heritage Command could speak to what this data means for sunken military craft and your responsibilities. Alexis, are you there? Uh, Alexis stepped out uh, for being, uh, taking a quick bite, but um, uh, we will use the, we'll, we'll, we'll protect the data that we get. Uh, we'll document the site and write a report on um, what we've learned. Um, this will help us to better protect the wreck in the future for our uh, requirements under the Sunken Military Craft Act. Um, Alexis, if you want to take over there asking questions, how are you going to use the data and anything um, gathered from this expedition? Oh, uh, well, uh, one of the first things that we're going to do is, is go through all the video that we've collected very carefully and compare it with any additional resulting data that was collected during the mapping one. Uh, we'll create a log of every feature that we've identified together. Uh, we'll create probably a report uh, with our findings. We'll concentrate on uh, areas that can tell the story of uh, Yorktown, which is the uh, evidence of the damage that we've seen associated with the battle. We'll correlate that with the historical and archival records to see whether our empirical and archaeological assessment uh, complements, supplements, or maybe even corrects the historical records. Um, and we'll go back and compare the state of the, the ship uh, wreck as we see today with what was observed by Dr. Ballard and, and the original visit to the site to see if there have been any changes to its condition. Uh, we termed that site formation processes and whether those have continued to degrade the condition of the wreck or whether in, in this particular type of environment, uh, other than the particular areas that we saw, for example, that maybe were susceptible to very high uh, temperatures, the burning, whether they are generally stable. And so um, this is in many ways uh, a baseline data set for us. Uh, it's been a very comprehensive site investigation. We've been very fortunate that um, the team on board Nautilus was able to give us so many hours on site in such a methodical and meticulous manner. And so we really, uh, it's a treasure trove of information and, and we look forward to pouring over it for the next several months. Sure, and then one, one last uh, element here, of course, is that this is a, a Navy uh, shipwreck. It's a Navy hunting military craft. Um, the Navy is responsible for it. Uh, we uh, own it, and we want to ensure it remains preserved. Uh, there is a statute called the Central Military Craft Act that does apply protective measures over uh, the private use of your tank. And uh, with all the information we've gathered today, uh, Obviously, there's no question that this is a big deal, all right? So uh, it gives us a, a, an opportunity to positively uh, affirm uh, the Navy's commitment to, to this particular site. Thank you. Oh, thank you all for that. Um, I was a, I'm especially intrigued by a by an 
ortho mosaic, a 3D model as a do a lot of XR, extended reality and virtual reality development. Um, and just thinking about uh, the opportunities provided by continuing, being able to continue to come back uh, to this site, to the Yorktown um, and that 3D map and, and continue to explore, continue to honor its stories. Seems like an especially fascinating data product, but uh, so much learning, no doubt, will show up in all, all kinds of different forms. Definitely follow along on Nautilus Live as, as we continue to share this story and, and the story of the entire expedition. Ala Amoana Kaiuli. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And uh, just uh, the earlier question of what's ahead. Uh, so uh, we've got about two hours or so of bottom time left on this uh, particular dive. And so we'll, we'll start uh, departing the seafloor here in a couple hours. So it'll be a long, long way to the surface. Um, it'll be probably about five hours before the ROVs are securely back on deck. And after that is, uh, we'll continue heading northwest. <laughs> we have a couple other potential archaeology targets uh, further up northwest that are also in very deep waters, and it's going to be uh, also similarly um, fortuitous if we are able to dive, if the weather window opens. Uh, we hope that it happens, but if not, uh, this expedition will continue for the next uh, three weeks. Uh, we'll be out at sea uh, diving on some of the most remarkable places here in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. For those that joined us on the very first dive of the expedition, uh, that one uh, landed on a, a forest of, of black, of big pink corals as far as you could see in any direction, uh, just reminding us of the incredible natural and cultural diversity that is in this place. Uh, so we'll be only exploring some of these really remarkable targets, some underwater mountains with a tremendous biodiversity. Uh, we'll have daily dives that you all will be able to follow on nautiluslife.org uh, and diving uh, daily through September 25th. At that time, uh, EV Nautilus will start coming back to port uh, and ending the Ala Alkauli expedition on September 28th in Honolulu. Um, and so yeah, well, there's still a lot to come, a lot of remarkable discoveries uh, to be made. Uh, so hope you can join us on this journey. And then at the end of that expedition, there are more expeditions. <laughs> they it's don't stop. <laughs> yeah, but wait, there's more. Um, if you're excited about uh, ocean exploration, we hope you'll join us all season long. Um, the 2023 expedition season, We'll continue live streaming around the clock 24 seven until late December, December 19th um, this year, I believe is our, our last date. So in addition to coming with us journeying to Papuhanamu Kuakea, uh, explore in our next expeditions, uh, some interesting technology advancements in ocean exploration, uh, sites um, in the geologist seamounts that we'll explore. We will be mapping um, south to our connected places of the Pacific, to Jarvis Island, and to around uh, the main Hawaiian Islands. So many more places to get to know the ocean and get to know the teams of people whose many different backgrounds have brought them out to the ship. I know I'll be tuning in. So excited for um, what happened earlier this season, incredible expedition season in the Pacific, and uh, still got months to go. So uh, definitely stay tuned. Uh, keep following on Nautilus Live on all the social medias. And if you want to know a little bit more about Did you want to zoom in down there? The please, incredible please. people that are uh, that are here in the control van that are Amber, on can shore. We zoom in? All right. Zoom in. That are on shore in Silver Spring. Um, folks across all our watches, all of the corps of exploration, um, you can find those on the Nautilus Live website. Uh, I imagine Robert Waters about to get a lot of hits. On the internet. Yeah. People want to know our ROV pilot. Do you want to look any closer, or is this a good size right now? That's good. We'll lose more more resolution if we go closer. That's good. Interesting. What do you think we're looking at? Grading material. Uh, yeah, it looks like a bunch of debris that's just fall falling in there. I couldn't tell you what that mound is. I mean, we've seen a lot of like microbial mat, it looks like, on the deck, but this 
I assume that's what yeah, the brown stuff strange. is, but then they're white. There's just a bunch of miscellaneous debris in there. It's, maybe it all fell in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is it So I believe we're looking at the aft elevator. So in a ship this size, how many levels would there be? Well, I don't know. I don't know the exact number of levels, but um, the top couple were we, we saw the uh, the island that had the bridge on it and the smokestacks. Uh, then there's the flight deck, and the hangar deck is below that, and then below that is the typical, um, you know, ship layout. You have engine room, berths, mess, uh, engines, fuel tanks, that sort of stuff. I imagine there were quite a few steps up if you were down, yeah. uh, down at the bottom and. Yeah, they had elevators. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible to still see the planks. I might. I'm probably just more used to seeing vessels in shallower water where there's. Yeah. There's activity that, that will eat that wood away, and you generally see the, the steel framing, and the wood is all gone. Yeah, the state of preservation is incredible. Yeah. Did someone say it was like 1 degree Celsius or 1.9 degrees Celsius? Yeah, very slow metabolic processes at those kinds of temperatures. They say ice baths are good for you. <laughs> Have you tried that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. All right, and uh, remember that the uh, the last part of the flight deck is missing. That looks yeah. like more damage up there, doesn't it? It does. You're looking in the top half of the screen? Yeah, mm -hmm. top okay. half. Top half is aft. There should be ah, more flight deck, flight deck beyond there, and it's mm. When we went around the stern last time, it's just not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when we near the completion of this current move, we should be right about on top of that area where the, that part of the deck is missing. Great. We sh um, what we'll probably want to do at that point is come up a little bit and then move to the left, so off site. Okay. Spin around and come down and then approach from a distance so that we can see if we're able to go under there safely. You want you mean like under well like the top deck or? see see the seabed mm -hmm. on this other side mm -hmm. and the flight deck area without our hangar deck area without going under the overhang. Gotcha. Okay. We are nearing the stern of USS Yorktown for those who are just tuning in. This is uh, NA-154 Exploration Vessel Nautilus Expedition Ala Amoana Kaiuli in uh, Papahanao Mokuakea. Uh, we are over five kilometers um, beneath the ocean surface on the seafloor um, at a historic uh, humbling site, sacred site of the USS Yorktown that sank on June 7, 1942. And um, we've been exploring now, I think, for over 12 hours. We have a couple of hours left uh, down here on the Yorktown before Atalanta will ascend. And uh, we're so thankful for all of you who are tuning in with your questions and your comments coming together. Um, an incredible cooperative, collaborative effort to remember this story um, that is, continues to evolve continues to teach us so much. I know those of us in the control van and onshore and Exploration Command Center in Silver Spring, Maryland, we're, we're all just taking this in. There's just so much, so much to learn from having this opportunity to observe this wreck in this way. 
in this moment of history in this way. Can we zoom? Down in there? If we can. Yeah. Okay. Emma, can you uh, zoom in? Yeah, ready. Going. You know, Maybe for the... Focus down further down in there. Yeah. For the most part, except for areas of, of notable damage, the flight deck's been remarkably intact, but that's not the story at the stern. There's, there's, there's huge section missing. There's all kinds of structural damage to the area behind this aft section, which would have supported that flight deck. Those are um, Han's reports of military, of, of battle damage, not of, uh, not of reports based on the 98 observations or? Battle damage from, uh, the, from the references, yes. Yeah. So this is that same pile, but from a different uh, perspective uh, okay. here. Yeah. Maybe that's part of the damaged area above that dropped in. Hard yeah, to say. Maybe. Hard to say. There was a near miss near the stern, which caused damage, and that may, and that had a, a, an eruption of water that fountained up and may have hit this extended flight deck area aft and compromised it in that way, but uh, there's no, no way to be sure. Yeah, I'm looking at that beam or pole next to uh, where we were zooming, and that's got a pretty significant bend in it, and that's that takes a lot of force. Yeah, yeah. Not listed as a direct hit. It says bomb missed, but exploded on the surface, causing a small fire on the fan tail and some shrapnel damage. But this is more than a small fire on yeah, the fan this tail. Yeah, um, this is kind of... This is more than shrapnel damage. Yeah, this is pretty big. And I don't think this is from its sinking. My guess is that that bomb was a little closer than they let on. But we have a picture of it. Mm, hold on. Pictures of it sinking. That's the bow. So are we looking at structure that's just been kind of torn away? Yeah. Yeah, that's just the frames underneath. Yeah. Wow. Is, is that Frank online? No, this is Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy. Um, yeah. We're down here looking here, and Hans, you were talking about how you know, part of the flight deck is intact. Um, you know, it's worth pointing out that you know, earlier we talked about you know, some of the World War II veterans um, and the different events that we've had with them in the past. <clears throat> Dr. Ballard was part of that, but you know, it's interesting to note, too, that we have servicemen and women who are tuning in who have, uh, you know, look at these sites and, and that's for central Right, can we zoom back? Follow our mission, follow the site. It's, uh, it's worth noting that we had heard from uh, Wayne Weirich, who had sailed on the USS Midway and on the USS Coral Sea, recognizing the tie down the uh, something that he was used to when he was working on the flight deck. So, thanks for tuning in, Wayne. <laughs> Absolutely, and want to, as we, as we do, sort of question and analyze the battle damage and remember the, the battle history of the Yorktown um, and the associated vessels um, in the Battle of Midway. Um, we had a viewer remind us that this was also a place they celebrated birthdays, holidays. This was home for many, many sailors for a long time. There were, there were happy times, there were good times on board the Yorktown. And uh, we can we can honor and remember those celebrations as well, even as she rests here on the seafloor. Looks like the whole stern's a big mess. Yeah. Yeah, Dan, that is a great reminder and a great comment by our viewer. So thank you, mahalo nui for that. Um, and you know, as we all have shared, just the crew on board Nautilus within the past week or so, being at sea together, we've shared laughs, we've shared mo moments and conversations. And I think, you know, each of us who have had experience at sea before in different vessels, different huaka'i into the oceans, um, you do grow a close bond with all of your crewmates, all of your shipmates. Um, 
there's a connection and a relationship that you have on board with your crew members that's unlike anything else. So uh, to know that all of the servicemen and women on board the USS Yorktown shared these relationships, shared this pilina with one another is, you know, also something that should be celebrated and uplifted. So mahalo, thank you to our viewers for your perspectives and your comments, your questions. Yeah, Mike, I just think of what you said about this thing descending through the water column and catching water by the yeah, by the be. flight deck because it. if it was just damaged and it when you when flew you yeah off. when you look at the the flight deck overhang at the bow and the stern the stern really overhangs yeah, yeah it's it does. quite an area that would be taking a lot of force from the water also maybe. if it had been like hit by shrapnel it's weakened yeah so just for quick orientation this this beam that we're seeing here that should be the very end of the the deck correct uh, or is there a little yeah. bit more okay no that should be it okay i think no there's get... more the deck Wait, extended way past the beams with the support oh pillars. yeah that's right the, yeah. the deck is below us the well not yeah, the, like the the hangar deck okay is. so i'm just yeah i'm just trying to see how how about how far we should move back so that we can drop down i don't know if you guys have a good idea for that maybe 15 meters would that be enough which direction are you going to move in towards left uh yeah well, left here yeah well, no, I would move um, back towards us because we want to be on that side of the ship. We don't need to go at, past the stern. Oh, okay, okay. I would just move like 20 meters uh, backward. To the starboard side, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're looking at the new aft edge of the flight deck where it's, where it's not anymore. And we're looking at the, the stern fantail deck. And that is the very stern of the ship. Okay, let's see. This has been a very deliberate and careful dive coming down onto a wreck of this nature, of this size. Um, there's a lot of questions about uh, what sort of obstacles we might encounter, the ROV might encounter, and so our ROV pilots and navigators working carefully with the archaeology and science team to to make sure that we can get in position to get the images and, and video and look that um, that is most useful while also ensuring the safety of everyone on board and of the ROV Atalanta itself. All right, I just called that one in, so we'll get moving shortly. Yeah, yeah that, that looks good. Look at all that torn away damage yeah. there. Wow. And how far off the stern of the ship that's there now, how far would that deck have extended? Um, Past the fantail, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, I mean, a couple meters at least. Yeah, I'm looking at the diagrams you gave us, Mike, now. Yeah, definitely uh, quite an overhang yeah. would, have, would have been there when it was in operation. And there are reports of battle damage to that to that deck on the stern. No, uh, there there was a a bomb that went off um, behind Yorktown, and shrapnel hit the uh, uh, hit the deck. But uh, I mean, in, in photos of Yorktown before it sank, this, the that part of the deck was still there, so it must have come off during the sinking. Interesting. Or like through the water column. Yeah. The after action report says. Heavy bomb exploded close. The stern on surface caused fragment damage and started small fires on fantail. Yeah. And that, you know, that might have just sufficiently weakened it and left things that weren't entirely visible that with a little bit of time on the bottom, even the sinking process would have resulted in this. It's some of it, you know, could be, you know, the start of that, let's say with the bomb damage and weakening it and then moving through the water column. There's some jaggedy bits. Yeah, so that's there. that's what I'm concerned about. We yeah. see how the flight deck is canted uh, to starboard, and so there's all of these bits and pieces of flight deck that are going to be overhanging us. So the question yeah. is, we want to move past that, 
and go down and see if we can even see anything of worth of value without because we're not going to get close to it yeah Mike, why don't we just fly above it and look back at that, that side from above it without having to get below it? Okay, we can try that. I mean, I don't, the lights on Atalanta are not uh, great, and we don't have the additional lights of the second ROV, so I don't know if you're going to be able to see much past the overhang, but we can give it a shot. I think I can come down a bit right here and yeah, okay. look out. That's helpful. Yeah, let's give that a shot. So we're trying to see that, that that quarter there. Yeah, but we're trying to go. I mean, as much as we can. Really, the the last uh, aft half of the uh, of the wreck. Did you guys overnight ever come across the name of the ship on the stern like you had mentioned or I'm pretty, anywhere? I'm pretty sure it was there. Um, we were we were moving a lot because we're going up and down. So I think we need to like take some stills of it and, and study them. Um, it looked like there were letters there, but we couldn't make out all eight of them at any one time. I feel like I saw all eight of them at some place on the stern, but they weren't in the right order. Another casualty of the sinking, the, the letters re reshuffled. <laughs> <laughs> we are currently exploring with ROV Atalanta. Um, the only ROV that's available to us right now that's rated for this depth, um, a depth of up to 6,000 meters. Um, Hercules um, and the two-bodied system that we typically deploy isn't able to come to this depth. And Little Hercules, those of you who are follow along will know that we also have Little Hercules who is who's, uh, just feeling a little bit sick <laughs> and uh, wasn't quite ready to uh, to make this dive and, and the weather window was now. This is the time that Kanaloa opened up for us to be able to explore. So uh, amazing job by the team, the ROV team, the engineers, the navigators. The archaeology and science team, our expedition leaders, all of the team on shore, and using the resources available to uh, get the best possible exploration of Yorktown accomplished and uh, help us all remember and honor this story and this sacred place in the waters of Papahanaumokuakea. I thought it was fascinating to learn from the engineers on board and the ROV team that one of the limitations of diving to this depth is not, in fact, related directly to the ROVs themselves, but it's the weight of the cable. And to get down to 5,000 feet, you have to have so much cable out, there's going to be an equation of how much strain the, the winch and the A-frame can have on the vessel. That's right. And so, you know, right now, as we're watching these screens, one of the other screens we have in the control van are showing us the peaks and rolls of the Nautilus. And uh, those are being carefully monitored. It relates to that narrow weather window we have for making dives to this depth. Dives to shallower depths have a much broader weather window. There's not so much concern about the strain, not so much cable out. It was interesting to see the cable payout because it went from the slightly rustier looking cable to the clean cable, yeah. which hadn't <laughs> been out before. Yeah, tension directly related, right, to uh, to the length of that payout of the, of the cable. The sheer weight of three miles of cable. If some viewers curious about the biology at this depth, uh, and there definitely is life. We are we are seeing life all over Yorktown. Uh, some of that evidence of life looks looks to be microbial, but there's also been some anemones and 
Uh, I think we've seen a, at least at least a handful of fish, quite a few jellyfish. Yeah, we've seen what seem to be a couple of types of sponges yep. here and there. And uh, yeah, the anemones seem to uh, like to colonize uh, some of the cables and uh, it seems to be some of the edges where we've seen some of these tears uh, in the ship from battle damage. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting to see that we've had we have actually seen a lot of those anemones um, and sponges on locations that are um, slightly elevated. So Might have a little there? bit more flow. Yeah, it's moving. As well, I noticed that um, on the underhangs of some of the. Um, hmm. Especially on the other side, the I think they were the gun locations um, mm -hmm. and protection areas there. There were um, some really beautiful um, anemones. They reminded me of the relicanthus anemones. I'm not positive, um, but we saw those anemones and we've seen several sponges. It's pretty amazing, and as well as the swimming and um, swimming sea cucumbers which are yeah. always so beautiful to see and, and and some small white jellies that I'm excited to excited to look into further. Oh, yeah and those swimming holothurians we see at a number of different depths throughout the ocean. I was uh, kind of surprised to see them down here but this is also the deepest dive I've ever participated in. Yes, they're um, they're actually you know sea cucumbers and these echinoderms and especially these swimming ones. They're fairly common in um, in the deep sea, especially um, you know they're able to float with the any sort of currents and um, but they can actually navigate to areas with uh, varied uh, food sources as well. So it's the, Well, yeah, I can't. I'm muted. Sorry, go. guys. <laughs> um, so Bob and Catalina, um, we're so close to the sediment here because it's it's canted so far. If we can kind of lateral, like at this angle, I think we're going to see most of this edge, and we're not going to be really in danger of hanging up on any of the, of the yeah. edge there. So if, if we can do that, I think that should yep. be the last thing that we want to cover. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Let's get a bearing on this. Can we uh, zoom in a bit? Okay. So yeah, Yorktown has become basically a substrate for an ecosystem here in the yeah. deep ocean. So it's, you know, in, in this strange uh, way, it's it's kind of continuing a life cycle on the ocean floor. For sure. Are those uh, rounds over there? That's what I was thinking. It looks like ammunition. Oh, though. they could be, yeah. Like right, right in there? Great spot, right? Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Wow. Yeah, those are are those the five inch shells? Whoa. Oh my look gosh. At that. That's what that's it looked like they could be. Yeah. Good eye, Robert. There were yeah. five inch guns on yeah. each stern quarter. Wow. <laughs> really good eye. Wow. Yeah. It's almost like you've done this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Bridge now. I was a fire controlman on, in the Coast Guard, so. Oh, oh is that right? and, uh, good thing you can spot things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of a, a Disney cartoon where it was Donald Duck and his three uh, nephews, and uh, he made them into like little ice things and fired them out of an ice battleship. <laughs> <laughs> As you would. As you would. All right, bridge is going to get us moving up along the side here now. In mi well, in a minute. Sounds good, thanks. Okay, can we zoom back out? Coming up. Oh, yeah, there for that gun, right there. Yeah. Yeah, yes. sure enough. We have a number of uh, viewers proposing uh, very creative, innovative solutions for how we might get another ROV system oh. <laughs> into the ship. But um, the thing that I really appreciate about our approach is 
Um, no, 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 it's, no, it's not no. about taking. It's it's really about uh, what is revealed to us, and uh, it's about <laughs> entering humbly and with permission. And um, that that feeling resonates across this incredible collaboration, and and it, it makes this work um, so much more special. It's it's we're not out here uh, with any bravado. We're not out here uh, trying to prove anything. We're here to work together to to conduct this successful but we do appreciate study. the creative uh, and, and and helpful <laughs> suggestions we do we do we love it um. were those proposed fixes for, for <laughs> little hurt <laughs> <laughs> Is that what that was? No, Robert um, we had a viewer wondering if we could have a non tethered ROV controlled from Atlanta by acoustic modem and could uh, well, kind of cruise I mean, through the hulls of the we, we don't have <laughs> equipment out here to do all that <laughs> they wanted you to build it on the fly <laughs> yeah, that doesn't MacGyver, I mean, MacGyver if anybody could do it <laughs> Yeah. There is a lot of talk about MacGyvering a uh, little hurt, but the, the problem is it's, you know, a five plus hour transit back up. So if your MacGyver doesn't work, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite a ways up. <laughs> but it always works on MacGyver whenever he <laughs> Yeah, let's just get Huey on the phone. <laughs> We do have an amazing, uh, ex experienced, knowledgeable um, craft of team of ROV wizards uh, on board, and they um, they do an amazing job taking care of our ROVs. And sometimes things just fall out of our control, mm -hmm. and uh, we work with what we have, and it's uh, that's an incredible lesson as well. So we appreciate uh, all of our ROV team. We have Zach and Robert here in the room with us, but. Um, there's a, a much larger team represented across all watches and doing a great job taking care of the technology. So, quick update. I do apologize. We had a, a miscommunication with the bridge. He took us at bearing 141 instead of 041, so we may get pulled away a little bit, but oh, we're no. going to have to readjust and try and move back. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. What time is our off bottom? Um, they said 11, which is in an hour and 12 minutes. Okay. Roger. I think plus or minus is okay. I'm not sure. While we're um, while we're repositioning, I, I'd I'd love to know, and some of our viewers would love to know, what's been from from the archaeological perspective, what's been the most surprising um, aspects of this dive so far? Has there been anything that really stood out to our team on shore, or or to Mike or Hans? I think the most um, unexpected thing so far was the uh, the damage you saw on the stern, which we can't quite figure out exactly what happened. Um, so we're going to have to look at maybe some of the imagery from 1998 and take a look at what they documented. Um, start there. This is an interesting angle. Yeah. I'm trying to pull this over with the lateral. Yeah, I'm just looking you at some of the debris sideways here. sideways on. I have to watch out for that bit that sticks out back there. Yeah. What I found impressive was the long-term change to the, the steel in the island. Oh, yeah. From the fires and the damage. And that's, I mean, that's that's our theory of why it's corroding like that. But, yeah, um, yeah there's something really different about it. It's, it's not, you know, impossible that these different steel for different parts of the ship, but I'm, I wouldn't imagine, I don't know why they would, but changing the metallurgy with heat with an intense fire like that, an explosion damage, having the long-term site formation impact that it does was very interesting. To our team uh, at the Exploration Control Center, any any uh, any major surprises as we've been uh, exploring for the past several hours on the USS Yorktown? I think it's less of a surprise and more of a happy understanding of how much the dive has told us more about Yorktown in some detail. Uh, we've gotten a, we have a better sense of the ship, the 
particularly for a team that never, you know, as we've heard from others, you know, people knew this festival. They lived on it. They worked on it. They served on it. And some of them fought and died on it. Uh, we only have the perspective of looking at this forensically as archaeologists, and we've gained more of an, an understanding of Dorktown as it is, and through that, uh, not only a sense of how it ended it, its life, but more a sense of it as a, a vessel. And I think that's important because ultimately what archaeology is about is people and what people build, where people work, where they live, and occasionally, of course, how they die. But with this, I mean, Yorktown as a vessel in the United States Navy, as a carrier, uh, all of that comes more into the picture at the same time that we're also presented with the opportunity to take that which we've seen and merge that with the archival record, with the reminiscences, the interviews, and the rest to more, to create, a, I guess, a fuller picture of Yorktown as, as it has evolved uh, over the course of this very long sit dive, which uh, has been incredibly revealing and exciting. Yeah, I think for me, you know, identifying and seeing the torpedo damage was a huge highlight. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a part of the story that we've read. It's famous. And Yorktown's perseverance and dedication to staying afloat and serving the country past those wounds is a big part of its legacy. And seeing it on the screen is, is powerful. With that, you know, actually seeing where they'd cut and had taken the guns off and getting more of a sense of that, of these guys working hard to save their home. Uh, that that was not so much a surprising again, but a powerful statement through the physical evidence. Mahalo Nui, thank you. You know the story. Do you still have the uh, thrusters on, kind of pushing just, us in? I just turned them You just said, okay, just to see. Yeah, we can see where we settle out and get a bearing from there. Yeah, I was kind of pushing us along here, but... Yeah. Yeah, we can angle the next move in to bring us a little closer again. Yeah. yeah are we still moving on that? Yeah. Time? Yeah, I got a little bit more to go. Maybe we could kind of push it along. We only got an hour left. All right. Let's see. Three. Bridge now. Could we please move two zero meters at bearing zero three five? Perfect, thank you. If you've just joined our live stream, this is uh, Daniel Kinzer, Science Communication Fellow on board Nautilus uh, with an incredible team here in the control van and on shore in Silver Spring, Maryland. Viewers tuning in from around the world, we're on the USS Yorktown. Uh, and uh, we will be for about another hour, I believe, um, before we ascend. Uh, we've had a remarkable 13 or 14 hours um, 
remembering and honoring the story of the USS Yorktown and, and the Battle of Midway out here in the sacred waters of Papahanaumokuakea. And, um, still exploring, so stay tuned, stay with us. Um, we appreciate everyone who's, who's joining in. This expedition is named Ala Amoana Kaiuli, Path of the Deep Sea Traveler. So obviously appropriate as we uh, look at this incredible shipwreck. Yes, Dan, and then just to elaborate on the the name of this expedition, Kai Uli. Kai Uli is this, the sea, Kai, and then Uli is just a spectrum of blue. Um, and when we go into the spectrum of blue, we see it as, uh, you know, the ocean holds such great knowledge, um, so many lessons. And so when we journey into these places, into this, these sacred waters of Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, um, when we journey here, then, you know, we are enlightened by the knowledge that it will reveal to us if we are, you know, privileged with that opportunity. Mahalo, Mahino. I think it's pretty interesting to note here that when we saw these gun tubs for the 5-inch guns and the 20-millimeter guns on the port side, the ones that had been salvaged, they had taken a acetylene torch and cut away the shielding. This is the starboard side. This was the high side when the vessel was listing after having been attacked when the damage control teams were trying to keep her afloat. But I'm looking at the shielding and either it fell outboard on its own or they were thinking of cutting away these guns as well. Huh. Those are pretty straight lines and that shielding should have protected that gun. There were eight of these five-inch guns, four forward and four aft. And this is the aft starboard quarter. And it looks like that shielding was cut in a similar fashion as the port side, but why would they be doing that on the starboard side? So I, I think I might've missed why. I don't know if I was off watch or if I uh, just didn't catch it, but why were they cutting away at the shielding? The aircraft carrier was listing to port some 23 so, degrees or more. So was this trying to cut cut weight, like they were, like they were to, jettisoning the, uh, some of the anti-aircraft guns? throwing the guns over on the port side to try to mitigate okay. that list. And when you talk about cutting away shielding and throwing away 20 millimeter guns, which I believe weighed about 400 pounds, in an attempt to right an aircraft carrier, right. you get an idea of what level of emergency actions you, you're, you're trying to take. Mm -hmm. These five-inch guns weigh a lot more. I didn't know that they had, sal they had jettisoned any of these, but one was definitely missing from the other side. And right, so I remember seeing that jettisoned. last night, and it looked like a very deliberate removal, too, looking at the base. So how would they cut away these gun shields in order to um, get rid of these, these guns? With a cutting torch. How long would that, would that take? That, that can be pretty quick. But, you know, how do you dismount a five-inch gun? I've never done it myself, so I couldn't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think many of, of us have. A lot of nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big nuts. You're tuning in and wondering uh, why it seems that we're we're getting this view that is moving up and down. That's we are using ROV Atalanta, a single ROV system on this dive. So everything that's happening on the ship, um, all the motion of the ocean here at the surface is being translated down that cable to Atalanta. I believe with about a five-minute delay. So the rolls you see on Atalanta are. Uh, those were the roles we were experiencing in the control van five minutes ago. Um, but uh, that's, that's what's making that image move up and down. We're actually all, I think, quite impressed um, with 
the stability. Seas are quite calm. We know at home it might feel like you're moving around quite a lot, but uh, this was a gift from the ocean to be able to enter this deep of a dive. Yeah, and for those of you who are used to seeing the uh, two-vehicle configuration, uh, uh, Atalanta or Argus uh, is usually the vehicle that uh, uh, sees this up and down uh, action translated down the cable, and then it allows uh, the second vehicle, Hercules, uh, to uh, uh, remain more stable. That um, is leashed to the, the tow sled and uh, uh, can have some slack in the cable so it doesn't see that wave action the same way. So. Uh, it's it's a little bit different with the single vehicle setup we're running right now. Robert, we have some viewers wondering, what is it exactly that would start failing on Hercules if Hercules was to try to come to this depth? Any insight on that? Uh, actually, the, the syntactic foam isn't rated for this depth. So that's sort of important. That's uh, <laughs> Yeah main buoyancy. Mm -hmm. like if that starts to fail, then it gets heavy, and then it isn't going to come up. Those are the big yellow foam blocks on, yeah. on that everyone recognizes on top of Hercules. Yeah, and then there's a lot of the, a lot of the instrumentation, the camera housings and sonars and such are uh, not rated for the depth. Right. So most of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the very important bits are... Uh, yeah, not ready to go this deep. Yeah, it's very challenging uh, coming up with technology that can uh, safely withstand the pressures experienced at uh, uh, 5.1 kilometers down. Yeah, it gets it gets very expensive. The, the that too. deeper rated foam is, I mean, the, the costs are exponentially higher to go deeper. I believe it. I've got to say thanks to Mike. He reminded me that you know the vessel did start listing the other way after she was uh, the vessel was torpedoed the second time. Yeah, so it was torpedoed on both sides a day later. Um, so it, maybe they were just like, oh, we know what to do. We'll get our acetylene torch and start kicking guns over the side. <laughs> yeah. Because it didn't it didn't actually sink until the next morning. So it looks like we've s about settled, and I think we're safely 20 meters or so away. I think we can, I can try to angle us back in a little closer. Yeah, we're pretty far away. Yeah. Bridge nav. Can we please move one five meters at bearing zero three zero? Thank you. Mike, are you seeing what you were hoping to see over here? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's the deck, the flight deck is very close to the sediment, which yeah. is not a surprise. Um, I think it's just to just complete the loop and, and get a sh get an angle on every every side of this. Right. So if, if we can get up to where the S1 dot is in, on the nav screen, I think we're golden. Mike, getting all those angles especially important for that ortho mosaic. Yeah, if we want a quality 3D render of this. Uh, well, this we're not site. we're not going to do a ortho mosaic of the whole thing. Um, we I don't think we have the coverage for that, but we we will do it for just the um, the island part. Oh, great. Okay, the tower and the bridge yeah. that we came on down that we yep. came down on yep. first. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we saw what suggests uh, the rescue effort on the starboard gun tubs. That's yeah, it's not something I've ever heard of before. Yeah, of the jettisoning of the guns. See that? Oh yeah. So weird. I wonder maybe that just is they didn't have a wall there. Well, the, the images and pictures. Oh, you've already covered that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think show the shielding continuously. Yeah, weird. And the other one's broken anyway.
has been one of the most deliberate vessel surveys I've ever seen. Oh, this is this is standard. <laughs> Careful and deliberate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely see if we can um, get us along. Because you were saying, I, I, I kind of lost it when I was looking at a few navigational things. You want to try and get back to the waypoint S1 is the goal? Yeah, if possible. Okay. As close as possible. Yep. I think we should be able to do that. You know, Hans, I think it's made to even feel more deliberate just due to the sheer size yeah. of these carriers, over 800 feet long, massive flight deck, uh, significant tower, this, this hangar deck that we've been able to look into, the elevators, there's yeah. so much to cover. Can we zoom in on that down there? Yep. That looks like where one of the, the boats would have been, just the yeah. starboard deck, but what is that? Could it be... It's not a gun position. It would be a wing. Can we oh, wow. uh, zoom in? All right, zoom in. Is that a piece of an aircraft? You can't tell. I mean, it looks like a barrel. Oh. Uh -huh. Oh. Yeah, here we, we go. Take the uh, hard to, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it could be a big conduit or pipe, I don't know. Yeah. I don't think it's an aircraft. No, I don't think so either, Not looking at it more closely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Were there any aircrafts that you spotted overnight? Nope, didn't okay. see any. The hangar decks were clear. Yeah, and this is not a, I don't think this is a hangar door, is it? No. This is a kind of a boat deck. Unless I'm confused as to where we are, but I'm pretty sure we're just forward of those aft five inch guns. Do you have any more zoom? I've got a little more, yeah. I guess we're gonna lose it here. In the I don't have any more iris, though. Yeah, there's some writing on that circular bit there. It looks Maybe like. it is Maybe. a hangar door with the, with it the could boat be. right yeah. in front. Yeah, because it's like partially accordion, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah I'm gonna try auto board. iris yeah. real quick, see if that helps us. Still, it didn't look oh. like an aircraft. Uh, no, it see. didn't. Not when I got a better look. All right. All right, ready to come out? Yeah. Okay. Just forward of the stern on the starboard side now, is that right? Uh yeah. Yeah. Kind of falling away here. Kind of leaning leaning here into the into the sediment on the seafloor. Yeah, the, I called in an angle that should hopefully get us back in. This is the USS Yorktown, sank on June seventh, nineteen forty two. All servicemen and women, all personnel were evacuated from the ship, but it was a costly battle on all sides um, over, I think it was 141 service personnel um, from the Yorktown died in combat in the Battle of Midway. And, uh, and, and many others on board other vessels, American and Japanese. And um, we were reminded earlier that those personnel would have celebrated, would have had joyful moments, would have had uh, laughs and uh, parties, good times, painas on board with their with their good uh, crewmates and friends, um, as well as exhibited tremendous bravery and mastery um, 
in so many different ways on board this vessel in combat. And I believe one of our onshore um, support crew members, they had also mentioned that, you know, people lived on this vessel. They worked on it, they served on it. As Dan had just mentioned, they celebrated their birthdays and different celebrations on here. Um, so I think just having that, that bravery, having that bond with your fellow crewmates, um, you know, it's very special. So, so intense, Mahina, to think about the, you know, this realm of, of the Hawaiian ancestors, this place where our kupuna um, travel to, voyage well, Be careful to. with some of those lines there. Sorry, yeah. Daniel. No, no problem. Uh, still to, up pretty to be in this yeah. place and to be um, mm -hmm. remembering these these Americans, these Japanese, um, mm -hmm. you know, service servicemen and women uh, who who came to their final resting place. Um, as part of this story in the sacred waters of Papahanaumokuakea in, in, in this uh, mm -hmm. Ainaakua. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, prior to our entrance into Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, the crew on board Nautilus, we asked uh, crew members to bring a ho'okupu, a gift or an offering. And this is just a tradition of the Kanakoivi, the native Hawaiians who enter this space. I mean, pre-contact and ancient Hawaiians our ancestors, they would travel to Mokumanamana, um, an island that rests on the Tropic of Cancer, what we call as Kealapulohiva Kane. And this boundary line separates the worlds between Po, darkness in the depths, and Ao, our living consciousness. Um, and so when we travel into the space, we enter across this boundary line, we step into the ancestral realm, a place where our Akua, our gods, spirits, deities, our Almaco, our family ancestors, they all reside. This is a place where we believe the was the inception of the Hawaiian universe. This is a place that where we as Kanaka, we come from the Kaiuli, the depths. Um, and, you know, we do strongly believe that upon our passing in this realm of Ao, this consciousness of Ao, that we'll return to the depths of Po and be reconnected with our ancestors. Um, so it just so happens that we are, you know, viewing a glimpse of this historic battle in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, a place of, you know, our ancestors, our deities, our gods. Mahalo nui mahina. So much kauna, so many layers of context and meaning and learning in this mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as you've described, this sort of vast depths of this ocean as a, as a place of knowledge, associated with a place of knowledge, almost like a library. And I think about uh, the books written by the Yorktown and by its personnel mm -hmm. and by the Battle of Midway that, that have added to that collection of knowledge held in these depths, something for us to understand and to access it in this way is... Um, well, we say chicken skin, mm -hmm. <laughs> chicken yeah. skin a little bit. So. <laughs> Do you? Oh, yeah. that, like, like the goosebumps here. Yeah. Yeah. Goosebumps. <laughs> I understand yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Lots of goosebumps on this dive. <laughs> chicken skin. Chicken skin. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. You got to translate my uh, mm -hmm. island slang. <laughs> island slang. <laughs> yes. I think I've heard that term used in the Midwest, too. Hey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Hawaiian Creole English. It's actually a dialect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can take courses at University of Manoa. Um, Those dads. You know what? It also kind of speaks to uh, his, you know, our history back and at home. Fifty caliber. Oh. Um, you know, as as many of you may know, that Hawaii is a melting pot of Pacific Islanders from generations ago during the sugarcane uh, plantation era. Um, many of our ancestors had come to Hawaii to find work. Uh, so we have, you know, just a rich history of hey, many Robert, cultures. Robert, looks like there's a line right around there. What about the line? I'm just wanting to point it out. No. Oh, yeah. I yeah. know so, it's not resolving very well on the screen, but I'm trying to stare at it. Yeah. So uh, we can, I'll, I'll go ahead and call in a move. Um, I'm thinking because we're still a bit off the deck. Yeah can angle in just to the inside of that S1 waypoint. Yep. All right. Bridge nap.
I think many people have different... Can we move three zero meters at bearing zero four zero? Yeah, we're pretty far away from the wreck right here. Yeah, we are. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we'll see if that I'm, brings I'm us even more in. I'm looking at 24 degrees down, so we're looking out quite a ways more than we would really want to be. Yeah. It's also really surprising to me how uh, buried this starboard side is. This must be a very, very soft sediment that it landed in. Yeah. I, I expected it, the, the flight deck to be a lot higher and just like over our heads, but it's just buried. Yeah. That's a surprise. I did not expect that at all. The, um, there was no imagery that I saw in from the previous dive that suggested that. I wonder if it could be gathering, right, as, uh, you know, the reef sort of different currents swirl and around this area and sediments piling up, or do you think that's all from upon impact? I mean, it, it, there is a little bit of sediment on the uh, on the flight deck, but not much. I, I wouldn't expect that an area like this would get very much sedimentation. Probably like a centimeter per thousand years is typical for abysses. Um, you're only going to get a lot of sediment if it's like at the mouth of the Mississippi or something. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't expect that. I, I think it just hit hard and it hit really soft bottom. Or the bottom is that soft that, you know, vessels will float on the surface of the water to the, the line of their displacement. And when they hit the bottom, all their weight, if that sediment is soft, yeah. they'll sink into it until the line of their displacement <laughs> of the weight of the mud. Right? P plus how, at whatever angle they decide that they want to be at too. Right. This one had holes in both sides of the hull, though, so it was going to be a uh, race to the bottom, which which side won out. <laughs> yeah, and the abyssal plane here, uh, the oceanic crust underlying these sediments is Cretaceous in age, so that's been plenty of time for these sediments to build up. Yeah, yep. So they could be very soft? Potentially. Depends on what the sedimentation rates have been like over those tens of millions of years. We did get to make geology relevant. Comes in <laughs> handy now and again. It's okay, I like my geology too. <laughs> taken a push core. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I, ha I have taken push cores at shipwrecks. Mahina, I'd love to, uh, I know we didn't get to finish your thought from earlier, dude. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry if I interrupted you. No, no operations, I think, yeah, always take Yeah, definitely. Burden. Most definitely, I agree with that. Um, but, you know, Olalo Hawaii, Hawaiian language, it is a language of symbolism and kauna, and there is a lot of double entendres, double meanings, and one word uh, can have many different meanings, uh, depending on the context. And I also, to speak to Hawaiian Creole English, or otherwise known as pidgin, uh, some may see, and especially from a Western standpoint, they may see that as a lack of intellect. Although that during the plantation era, uh, Hawaiian Creole English or Pidgin, it was used amongst many different cultures, many different people with a diverse background, uh, different ancestral backgrounds to communicate um, in their environment, to communicate where they worked, to communicate where they lived. And so, you know, some may see that, or speaking pidgin, or, you know, the lingo language that we share. But, you know, really, it's something that connects us as island people. It's something that we have in common. It's something that we share that is unique to Hawaii. It's unique to Hawaiians. It's unique to people who share and relish the local Hawaiian culture that we have within our islands. That's right, Mahina. I th I'd say some of the most intellectual conversations I've had were had with aunties and uncles in, in pigeon, speaking mm -hmm. pigeon. So, absolutely. are coming up on just about a little over half an hour left on bottom. Uh, again, just such an honor to be here with all of you tuning in and um, trying to understand this story, honor this story um, surrounding Yorktown of Yorktown. 
so many people connected to this story, so many cultures, so many places. Certainly this uh, sacred waters is this final resting place for USS.